you absolutely have everything you need until you get to a point where you think oh, well there's certain limitations or you're actually hearing the downsides of stock plugins and you know this probably isn't going to be for a couple of years this isn't going to be until the point where your mix is already sounding great despite using stock plugins and then it's like okay now i can start buying them until you get to that point you really do just want to focus on the essentials Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Today's episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is sponsored by Roswell Pro Audio, maker of handcrafted microphones in California. Inspired design and impeccable attention to detail will help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful line of microphones at roswellproaudio.com. Sending your music to be mastered can be scary, but sending your music to a total stranger for mastering can be really scary. Chris Graham is a Billboard chart-breaking mastering engineer with thousands of credits and knows how to make your record sound fantastic. But more importantly, he understands that there is one person that really knows what a great record sounds like, and that's you, rock stars. So if you're thinking about hiring professional mastering, but not sure if it's right for you, go to chrisgrammastering.com and get a free sample mastering of your song. Go find out just how great your record can sound at chrisgrammastering.com. Just click the link included in the show notes. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Rob Mazes, an audio professional, musician, and educator. He's helped thousands of home studio owners produce better music and mixes through his website, musicianonamission.com. He's also a contributor to the Pro Audio Files, Udemy, Toots Plus, Recording Revolution, and Sonic Scoop. And Rob likes to teach mixing minimalism with the goal of helping you make a great record without the clutter of plug-in overkill. So he is joining us today to help us listen through the din of plug-in choices clamoring for our attention when it comes time to mix. Rob is going to narrow the choices down for us to the only seven plugins you'll ever need. Also, at the end of this episode, remember to go download the free extra content that Rob's put together for us at musicianonamission.com slash lidge. So please welcome Rod Mazes to Recording Studio Rockstars. Rob, my man. Are you ready to rock? Absolutely. <laughs> awesome, <dude. laughs> Raring and ready to go. I've been so excited about this. Uh, I, I don't do this kind of stuff often, so it's, I've been looking forward to it, you know, and it's great to be here. That's very cool, man. And you were saying before we started this that sort of in, in your British way, uh, a pleasantly and a welcome over-the-top experience <laughs> to be asked <laughs> if you're ready to rock, right? <laughs> Yeah, I love it. It's we both listen to some uh, some podcasts like that that are very over the top, and <laughs> it's nice to get that energy because it's so easy when you're just talking over the phone to someone, and you kind of you chill out for a bit, and then it gets a bit boring. So yeah, I really appreciate the enthusiasm. Well, we're glad to have you here. So tell us more about yourself. Tell us how you got started in this and and what you do. Sure. So um, to go all the way back to the beginning, probably a lot like everyone else in the sense that I started out just wanting to record myself at home. Um, and this is probably when I was like 13, something like that. That then turned into a passion for recording, mixing. That's when I got the bug and decided, you know, this is what I want to do for a living and started figuring out the best way to do that deliberated for a long time after doing kind of like um, a short studio internship deliberated for a long time whether to go to university college um, over there <laughs> and decided that was the best route forward unfortunately didn't have a great experience with that which i'll probably mention again later but but from that point onwards just realized you know what i need to go out and actually put myself out there if, if i'm going to make this work so so that was when i started doing more freelance work freelance mixing um, and eventually thought I'm going to start a website. I want to teach more people how to do this. I taught a couple of people and found that a really enriching web, uh, a really enriching experience. So made the website that also helped me to find more work, which was amazing. And then yeah. over time, over the last couple of years, that's, that's become the main fo focus really. I love teaching people. I love reaching more people 
and having like a bigger impact and as amazing as it is working with musicians you know on a smaller scale and actually helping them to produce great music when you're teaching this stuff you can reach thousands hundreds of thousands um even millions of people and help them to produce better music so yeah. that's kind of been a shift in thinking for me and that's kind of brings me to where i am now that's sort of something that has been my mindset and my epiphany with recording studio rock stars is i realized that it gives me an opportunity rather than to try and make one record and hope that a thousand people will listen to it and love it i'm able to reach a thousand people and help them make great records that will reach yeah. you know a m multiplied number of people so it's a it's yeah. a lot of fun to be able to just you know help help people yeah, absolutely. And that's actually an interesting way of thinking about it. I never thought of it that way. Because if, if you worked on a, a, an album that reached tens of millions of people as in listeners, then you're having a huge impact that way. But you could have an impact on the musicians themselves by going about it in a more educative way. So it's interesting to actually draw that line there where it's like, okay, do I want to reach and improve the lives of tens of millions of listeners? Or can we actually improve the lives of tens of millions of musicians? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I never thought about it that way. That's quite interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm able to make far more records now than I ever was before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's the cool thing about it. Well, so Rob, when I was checking out your website, you had a pretty awesome story about your journey through recording too, where you you talked about um, as a kid recording your first band and and mixing it, and then you know you played it back, and it was like you know you had this like your heart dropped a little and sank a little listening back to your mix. Do you want to tell that story a little bit? Yeah, so this probably happens so many times, <laughs> and I'm sure everyone goes through that that same experience where you get this kind of like this urge, and it all starts with this desire of you know what I want to record myself, and as soon as that that switch goes it's then this kind of this beginning of this like epic journey and most of the beginning of that journey is just full of frustration and disappointment and in my case and i'm sure in in a lot of other cases you you start finding stuff online and when, when i started out there wasn't like loads of youtube videos there wasn't like incredible podcasts like this where you could get inside people's heads instead it was like one or two websites tweak heads anyone listening might remember that one i don't think it's going anymore but but mostly it was just the case of trying to figure this stuff out and after like a probably a, a year or two years of just trying to do it myself pretty much got nowhere and i think that's still the experience that people have now even with all this like incredible information that's out there the problem is now the opposite there's too much information there's too many videos so you still have this experience that, that i had where you start out you get this incredible urge and you're just so excited to get started but then from that point onwards you just immediately hit this wall of disappointment where you put you know blood sweat and tears into your first ep that you decide to record with your band for example and then you come out of the other end and it just sounds like absolute trash and you don't want to share it with anyone it's yeah. just different kind of causes now and that's that's a lot of what i kind of try to talk about is how to avoid that overwhelm that is now the issue it's not so much the lack of information it's now that there's too much information out there and you know before you could go and get a studio internship and that was relatively easy to do now that's much much harder to do so instead you resort to learning from youtube videos and and that kind of stuff and reading online which is great but there's still lots of issues with that and you still go through that same journey another thing that i want to make sure is that people are aware that kind of everyone goes through that and just because you're not happy with how your mix is sound and you're not happy, even confident enough to share it. That doesn't mean that it's never, it's always going to be that way because a year from now, um, you'll feel proud of them as long as you put the work in. Um, and I just want to make sure people know that they're kind of not, not on their own in that sense. Yeah. I think I was a little bit blessed when I started recording because I was so out of touch with how good I, it maybe needed to sound that I was just thrilled to hear myself play back off a cassette, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was yeah. so excited to hear my band playing back that yeah, it, it didn't even occur to me that it didn't sound very good, you know, not for a <laughs> while. But then I went to school and I began to really pay attention to great sounding records. And it was at that point at which I really began to try hard to yeah. make a record sound great that I realized I was like, whoa, I've, I'm, <laughs> I'm a little bit off the mark here. <laughs> 
right? Yeah, exactly. It's not until you have that point of reference when, and and this, again, it depends on how high you set your sights. It's how, how much you can be disappointed potentially. Because if you, like you say, you're just very happy to have your own work and listen to it and be like, wow, look at this amazing thing I created just out of nowhere. Uh, but then as soon as you start comparing that to your favorite artist, um, depending on what genre, if, if it's like older music that you're into, you can definitely get get to that level of quality quite quickly in a completely different sense, obviously. But yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, so did you um, sort of have an aha moment or sort of find a solution to this initial struggle yourself? Yeah. So I was hoping that that aha moment would come when I did decide to go to university, but it really didn't. Um, that was a that was a huge disappointment. And I think as soon as I started realizing that the, the quickest way to learn is definitely from from observing others and learning from others. And that's, you know, that's a, a well known thing. But you have to kind of go out there and be proactive about that and find those people yourself. And for me, that was a, a big turning point. As soon as I started saying, well, I want to actually go out there and learn from people with experience. And, and as soon as I started seeing inside their mixes and, and seeing, you know what, there's not actually a whole lot to it. It's actually relatively simple. It's more about the bigger picture and it's more about how you approach this and it's more about your mindset and your philosophy and that kind of stuff. It's not that there's like these secret tools and techniques and all this expensive equipment that's making the the difference. Um, so there are a couple of kind of aha moments there. For me, that was when it turned around kind of as soon as I started learning from others and then you quickly when you start doing that you quickly start to get a sense for well actually it's not this huge complicated thing it's relatively simple when you take it back down to the stuff that actually has an impact yeah i remember learning a few tricks that i didn't know about as well but really i, I agree with you i was it was remarkable how few things you really needed to do you just needed to do them well and you really needed to understand what went into mm -hmm. making a great production and what, what went into making a great mix. And like you said, it had a lot more to do with carefully selecting a minimal palette of the right choices and, and mm -hmm. learning, you know, working with people who had that experience and, and learning and being in that, the right environment to, um, to really learn this stuff. So that's pretty cool. Absolutely. Well, so I like Absolutely. to ask our guests too to share an inspirational quote at the beginning of the podcast. Get us kind of psyched to hit the studio. Have you got anything you'd like to share with us? Yeah. Uh, so the one that comes to mind um, isn't actually. I don't know how what kind of quotes you normally get from this, but the one that I thought of isn't related to recording or music at all. It's "Be the silence that listens." I'm not sure wh where I actually found this quote. It's Tara Brock, and I mm -hmm. believe she is like a, a Buddhist. Um, yeah she has a great podcast like meditation fact. right okay so i think i think i i'm not sure how how i came across this but for me that's just a really nice concise quote that i like to think about more in a philosophical sense and just life in general but it also applies very much to music making and the record making process um be the silence that listens and that kind of promotes you to obviously listen and, and take account of what actually is going on, but also be the silence, I think is interesting because that forces you to think about in a different way where you're not going in there with your ego. And if you're approaching this from a, a mix of viewpoint, you're not going in there with your ego saying, well, I want to make it sound this way and I want to show off my mixing chops and I want to use this new piece of hardware that I just got because it sounds awesome and I want to impress my engineer friends. Instead, you're the silence that listens. So you're the one that's actually trying to be transparent. You're trying to take a back seat in this and think, okay, what does this actually need? How can I actually observe this and take it to its best potential without necessarily inflicting my own ego on it? So do people normally come back with quotes relevant to music? Or No, no, that's <laughs> a great quote. I love that one. I think that's perfect. I think that's very relevant to music. Uh, I mean, you know, how else are you going to make records unless you know what they sound like in the first place? So obviously the art and the skill of listening is terribly important to making a great record. But mm -hmm. I also appreciate how you talked about, you know, finding ways to kind of remove your ego because honestly, whether I'm making music all by myself or have made music with other people in collaboration, it's only when I've been able to remove my ego from the process that the very best stuff comes forward. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and it's interesting there that you said, even when you're working on your own stuff, because there you'd be tempted to think, well, if you're working on your own music, then it's fine. It's all about your ego. But it does kind of become this, the, the song or the track becomes this thing within itself. And then also I find when you're working on your own music, it's even easier to get kind of sidetracked and also become less and less objective as time goes on if you're recording writing mixing your own tracks so so then yeah exactly that be the silence even in that situation where you're working on your own music and it's like okay i'm just gonna throw my ego all over this taking a step back and actually thinking okay right how do i remove myself from this situation and approach it from a more objective position and help it to be the best song or the best track it can be um, rather than just you know showing off my own interests yeah you know that voice that little voice that tells you that that sucked and that was a terrible idea and what were you <laughs> thinking that's your ego yeah. speaking loud and clear all the time <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's a good point actually. so Maybe make it be silent always listen yeah <laughs> yeah and that's that ego is the enemy great book by ryan holiday um if anyone wants to learn more about that because i think ego is definitely has a, a big part to play in in the music making process whether you approach this from a musician's perspective from an engineer's perspective from a producer so yeah you're absolutely right well very cool well we've kind of been jumping around and you've already kind of talked about an important failure in the studio um, and an aha moment but do you have any more stories around that that you'd like to share or should we just jump forward to some deeper questions yeah, I mean, there's there was no kind of one specific moment where it all clicks. And I think that'd have to be a pretty crazy, <laughs> crazy moment for that to be the case. It was just these, these collection of moments where I started to see what really went into it. And when you get to look behind the scenes and it goes back to this idea of recording minimalism or focusing on the essentials, because it's so easy to start doubting yourself and think oh yeah i need better gear i need this i need that but when i realized that that wasn't what made a, a good record in fact it was the complete opposite of that that was probably the biggest turning point for me and that that then has like this kind of knock-on effect where that realization led to like several smaller realizations such as focusing on the bigger picture and rather than focusing on like smaller details um even when you're mixing you're know, starting um i start every mix with mix bus processing and, and volume balancing and bigger broad sweeps as opposed yeah. to starting with like EQ in the kick drum. I mean, obviously there are cases where that is the best approach or starting with the vocal is the best approach, but just lots of smaller realizations kind of like then trickle down from that, you know, uh, focusing on songwriting first, then the sound in the room, then mic placement and then only then focusing on mixing and, and realizing that the more you can do in those higher stages, it will have a trickle down effect because it just keeps it simpler. And when you get to the mix, it sounds amazing. It's a great song. You've got an easy job. So I think that realization that there's really not a whole lot to it and it's more about focusing on the essentials mm -hmm. um, did kind of have several knock-on uh, moments, <laughs> um, which I'm sure we'll touch on again. Yeah, so, you know, it's understanding that something that seems very complex, sometimes the way to tackle it is to just break it down into its elements and the elements themselves can be really simple. And so like, mm -hmm. you know, if you're looking at a record that just sounds incredible and it's all this stuff and you're like, how in the world do I ever get to that point? It's realizing that you really just have to start at the very beginning and the beginning would be, you know, a great song, for example. So mm -hmm. let's, let's, we're going to talk about this uh, great topic that you brought for us today. The only seven plugins you'll ever need, which is awesome. But let's pause for just a moment. Let's save that for what is, uh, you know, what it's probably about, which is kind of the mix process. And let's back up mm -hmm. a little bit and break down some of those elements that we need to get through to get to the mix process. So mm -hmm. here's a question for you. What are some things to consider about making sure, you know, how do you know or how do you start out with a great song to begin with? How would you like to respond hmm. to that? <laughs> Yeah, that's a brilliant question. For me, there's kind of two answers to that. And it, it comes down to whether you're working on your own music or if you're working with other people's music. Because sometimes if you're approaching this from the perspective of an engineer and if um, you're listening to this and your ambition is to be like a, a mix engineer or something like that, then instead it's more about working with the band and maybe, you know, trying to wear that producer hat, even if you're not necessarily producing the track and and realizing that 
anything you can do that's going to make the song better it's kind of your duty to do that and that's when it comes down to like people skills and working with the band to try and make suggestions here and there but the other answer which kind of is more my focus and more in what i teach is if you're working on your own music i think there's i see a lot now with with my students in particular that they start writing songs and they start writing music and they start mixing them they start recording them and mixing them and they, they get these finished tracks and they're not happy with them and immediately they start to think okay well i'm not recording it well enough or i'm not mixing it well enough but as right. you say it's about taking a step back from that and saying right okay before i even get good at mixing and recording i need to get good at songwriting or at least do both at the same time so in terms of actual kind of songwriting advice i think if i was just going to give one piece of advice it's just to finish as many complete songs as possible and i went through a, a very long phase and i think everyone goes through this where you start to write your own music and you just have all these like fragmented ideas and like riffs and choruses and they're just kind of all over the place and you try and like stick oh, yeah. them together maybe and you're not really happy with it but the process of sitting down and actually finishing a song finishing a track writing the intro if it's got one that you know the verses bridges links that kind of stuff that's when you start to get into like really fast progressive territory where you're sitting down you're actually finishing songs and you're churning them out because also it's a numbers game so if yeah. i was just going to give one piece of advice it would be yeah to sit down and finish as many songs as you can because once you've got uh, 10 20 songs under your belt it's not it doesn't even have to be a huge number like finishing 10 or 20 songs sometimes that can take people years if they work on like one ep a year and they do three or four e songs on that ep or even if they do like an album every or if, or if they have a, a loud ego <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly exactly finishing 10 or 20 songs that sounds like that ah, it's nothing but actually it, it can take people years to do that so that would be yeah. my main piece of advice there is to actually just go sit down and finish those first 20 songs well a couple of takeaways from what you said one is the idea of completing a number of songs so there's this idea that we have terrible ideas and we have great ideas we have we have crappy songs and we've got brilliant songs but it's almost like they're all sort of um, sequential in series, like like train cars mm. all hooked together. And you might have a brilliant song, but it's like 13 cars back, and you can't get to <laughs> it until you get past the first 13 cars. So it's that process <laughs> yeah. of getting your ideas out, of letting your songs out, because you have to let the crappy ones out and not judge them, because the, the loud <laughs> ego is the judgment that prevents that song from getting out in the first place. But it's that process of letting the songs through, letting them out that gets them out of the way, you know, for the great exactly. song to come forward. That's also going to help with perfectionism as well, which I think is a huge issue that people have. Like coming back to the idea of ego is if you don't commit to whether that's publicly commit or even just internally commit to finishing those first 10 songs, you're never going to actually finish them. And, and another way you could think about it is like, yeah, you're just kind of one song away, like the next track that you write could be the best song you've ever written it could be the worst but you're only ever one song away from like the best song you've ever written and generally people people go through periods of you know writer's block and stuff but generally the latest song you've written is generally in your opinion um the best because the best one <laughs> so certainly every so, band yeah, i ever worked song. with <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly some bands go down <laughs> obviously there's there's that's a whole other topic we could talk about but yeah that remembering that you're just one song away and like if even if you're not happy just kind of plowing through and accepting that you know not every song has to be great and then you can just kind of sweep it under the rug or release it as a demo either way it's good practice uh yeah i, I like that idea of the the trains in succession yeah well i had this epiphany once when i was doing a lot of running i was uh, I, i'm very into barefoot running and i was training for a marathon oh cool and i, and I would have these epiphanies because you're you don't have much else to do when you're running for that long <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but one of them was i was looking at the path and i think i was looking at like the crud on there that i was about to step on and kind of wishing it wasn't there but i had this this <laughs> idea i was like you, we have to clear the path in front of us to make way and make room for opportunity. And I think that applies to ideas and songwriting as well. It's that idea of it's like, you have to kind of let go of and get rid of, let the thing you're holding on to now, the song you're working on go so that you can make room for the next one to come about. Uh, but I also yeah. wanted to make a comment on something else you said, which was, you know, we have these sketches and these riffs and things and we're, and sometimes we just try and assemble them all. Rockstars, I want to encourage you, 
don't feel bad about sketches and riffs. So sketches and riffs are great and and you got to start somewhere. And that is a wonderful place to begin your ideas. You want to be free and like let your ideas out. I find it really helpful to do a bunch of sketching sometimes and then come back for round two and say, all right, I'm going to go through those sketches, pick the one I want, and I'll work up that song. And that that's where it gets a little harder, mm-hmm. which is, I think is what you're talking about, Rob. You have to like Absolutely. put in the effort to like just keep keep trucking on that song until you get it done. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you said that because I don't want to put people off writing because <laughs> all they can think of is sketches and riffs. Because yeah, it's it's almost like you could take that concept and apply it on a smaller level as well as with complete songs. You could apply that to riffs or just choruses. And when you you write 10 choruses and maybe the 10th one is the only good one and then, then you finish the complete song from that. So yeah, you could break it down to a whole nother level there. Yeah, I remember hearing a story of Daniel Lenoir producing U2. And, you know, I think it was something along the lines of like, they would just kind of jam on something and he'd just keep them playing and playing and jamming on that thing until it's almost, you know, when you say a word over and over again, and all of a sudden it doesn't Mm. make sense to you anymore. (laughs) And it's like, yeah, like doing that until the ego is just like numb. And then Bono would, you know, try words and just random stuff over the top of the outro. And I think that's how they wrote Beautiful Day was a story about that, I think. (laughs) That's very cool. <laughs> well, so let's, like let's sorry, I'm, I'm keeping us on all kinds of tangents here, but let's, <laughs> let's bring it back again. So now we've got this great song. Um, what comment would you like to make about how do you treat that great song and have a, uh, a great production? Yeah, I mean, before we even start about mixing, we need to obviously touch on making sure that you're, first of all, happy with the song before you commit to recording it. I think that's that's something else that a lot of people will do is they'll skip that whole pre-production phase, which goes back to the idea of songwriting. But everyone says it, everyone knows it, get it right at the source. But I think the key with that is really, for me anyway, when I think of that phrase, get it right at the source, when we get into the recording phase and it's, yeah, like you say, okay, we've got this great song, now we just need to track it. It's not as simple as just, okay, get it right at the source doesn't just mean mic placement. For me, it's then taking another step back and looking at those those steps between the song and the mic, because I feel like a lot of people overlook that. When you say to people, okay, so recording is very important in the overall production process. You need to make sure you spend you know, so much more time in general recording the mixing uh, because that's going to be the 80% that's going to have the impact your kind of your general or at least i know my general kind of inclination is to then skip straight to okay well what mics am i using where am i putting these mics right but in fact there's like there's several key steps there even that are going to have a a bigger impact before you get to mics and that's finding the right room thinking about acoustics and this doesn't have to be here working in a home studio that doesn't mean you know spending loads of money on acoustic treatment just thinking about it and grabbing stuff around your home if you if you do have a, a proper room set up obviously that's something that you've, you've thought about already but actually considering okay the room the tone in the room the tone on the instruments choice of equipment you know how does the drum sound what drums am i using are they properly tuned you know have i spent like an hour just tuning the snare <laughs> yeah. stuff like that is it, you naturally kind of skip over because it's the boring stuff but then it's the boring stuff that counts so for me if we're talking about like the larger production process and um, the next stop from step from that songwriting phase would be to start thinking about the room the equipment the gear the sound in the room and then you've also got to think about performance because that's just like a whole other tangent that we could go down where you can have a great song and a, and a bad performance and as producer as a writer as an engineer whatever role you're playing it's your duty to try and get the best performance as well so that's a whole other aspect before we get to okay what mic am i going to use where am i going to place it so that's just something i just wanted to bring up there because a lot of people talk about get right the source and absolutely that's that's the case and your aim is to do as little mixing as possible whenever you're recording you want to get it to a point where in an ideal world it would need nothing apart from volume balancing if if you could do that and it would pr- pretty much be um well it depends on the genre but that'd be very difficult to do but that's kind of what you're striving for so just don't forget those steps in between the song and the mic that are kind of easier to overlook because as soon as you start to think about this from an engineering perspective you skip straight to equipment and microphones but you need to remember those those steps in between yeah i think that's great and and i want to say that back to you too um Rockstars, the the idea of get it right at the source, I think initially, 
as you're suggesting, Rob, we think of that as meaning, oh, we've got to have a great microphone and you've got to place the microphone just right. And that is absolutely true. But then you have to ask yourself, well, what am I placing the right microphone in front of? You know, what's the instrument? Is it a, Mm. you know, which acoustic guitar is it? Which electric guitar is it? Which drum is it? Okay, it's that drum set. Well, but what do those drums sound like today? You know, are we treating that that tom in a certain way where it's got no sustain and it's dead and tight? Or is it long and ringing out? And then the space, as you talked about, is the space reverberant and big and splashy? Or have I brought in lots of blankets and an extra couch and a chair and tightened it all up so that it's super dead? And then, but before you make those decisions, that's that production decision that says, okay, in order for the right part to exist in this song, the, you know, the instruments need to be playing with this kind of sound quality to them. Like I want the drums to be super dead, like a, a old David Bowie record. I want them to be, you know, gigantic, like, and, and, and roomy, like Pearl Jam or something like that. So it's mm-hmm. knowing it's making those decisions. So it's, it's the, the source keeps moving back on you, right? It keeps shifting back one notch. Um, exactly. This, yeah. That's cool. That's, yeah, great great summary there. And I think also it's important to note that that continues through the process. Just because you finish recording um, doesn't mean you then forget about like the songwriting and and the arrangement because you can still do things to improve that, fix that way down the line, even when it gets like, okay, the mastering engineer might pick up on something and you say, you know, have you tried doing this? You you still readdress those issues as you progress through the production process, Yeah, um, which I think is another thing that a lot of people overlook. Well, it's, I think I've mentioned it before on the podcast, but I took a painting class when I was in college and uh, we were supposed to do a still life and, and it had all these elements in it. And I went home and I was like, okay, I'm going to paint this one detail perfectly and bring it into class <laughs> tomorrow and show it. And I was like, here's my one thing I painted perfectly, you know, and, and the rest of it is just an empty canvas with some sketched lines on it. And it didn't look very good. And another student brought in, they had sort of like done a little bit everywhere and it looked mm-hmm. really amazing. And that's when I learned from the teacher, this concept of pushing a painting. So it's like pushing a, a record, you know, where you kind of need to work all the parts all together all the time. Hmm. I don't know if this is a stretch to draw this analogy, but like you're saying, you're always addressing the songwriting. You're always addressing the production as you go. And it's okay to just keep tweaking things as best you can. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because you can go to, to either extreme um, because the other extreme is that you you never finish a track or you're mixing and suddenly you're now going back and like tweaking things from earlier and it's it's it is difficult because you're it, there's it's natural to have these clear divides between each section of the production process and like you're saying exactly we need to think about songwriting even when we're mixing um but then and this is where it, the finesse comes in because then it gets to a point where it's okay we need to think about that stuff but you also need to kind of commit to what you have at each phase because otherwise you can just endlessly tweak. So it's almost like this balancing act yeah. I find between, you know, you, obviously you're not neglecting that stuff. And if you've got a track and it sounds thin and weak and you're, you're mixing it and you're thinking, you know what, this track has got no bottom. I need to add some bottom end in there. And you're trying to, I don't know, you're using like R bass to add in like some frequencies down there and you're boosting low end and, and that kind of stuff in reality the issue is actually the arrangement and there's not like a there's not a synergy between the kick and the bass or there's just there's no bass part or something like that so then then it's your duty to say okay you know what i'm i need to fix this i need to fix the arrangement this isn't a mixing problem but then at the same time it's committing at each phase and saying okay now that we've got our tone on the guitar amp for example, um, if you're even if you're using amp simulation, then committing to that tone as you move into the mixing process. Otherwise, it is tempting to like endlessly tweak. So yeah. it's it's hard when talking about this stuff because there are always two extremes, and it's always like a bit of a balancing act down the middle. Like the, this idea of the middle path, and the best route is often the middle route, and not leaning towards either extreme and neglecting them, but also not leaning too much towards one extreme and spending too much time there. I don't know. It's it's hard to put into words sometimes. Yeah. Well, there's a great expression about you know art and records records are never finished they're just abandoned (laughs) you know and and you think about painting and i'm like you know i wonder if van gogh and picasso did they always feel like they finished their paintings or did they just kind of let go of them you know i don't know if people were offering Mm. them millions when they were painting them probably picasso but you know that might be an easy time to let go of something 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think I, I might be wrong, but yeah, they were both kind of very poor and un, unrespected during their lifetime. So, so yeah, it must have been hard. And, and I, I pronounced and it wrong. Is, it's Van Gogh, right? Oh, is it? Oh, I, I have think, no idea. I, think I would have said Van Gogh as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, so um, so is, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was just saying, this is something else that people struggle with a lot. It's just finishing tracks because it's when it comes to mixing is you never feel like it's finished and you do have to create, like you said there, like uh, if you're getting loads of money for something, then maybe it's easier to say, you know what, this is done. But in, in reality, um, it, that's not often the case. And instead you have to like set a finishing time to abandon the record because uh, it will never be finished. So yeah, I like that idea of abandoning it. And yeah. then also suggesting maybe, so you need to set a time. So like, I'm going to spend a day mixing this. And at the end of the day, like it's it's abandoned, it's finished. Yeah, um, indeed. It's an interesting way of thinking of it. Well, so um, we're moving forward here and we're coming up to our, our plug-in discussion. But before we get there, uh, tell us what's one of the most important things about getting the recording of the drums right. Yeah, so drums, uh, I think going back to this idea of, thinking of you know what's what's the higher up stuff that i can play with that's going to have a bigger impact with drums obviously to be honest for me it's the room before it's the kit and obviously the kit is going to have a big impact but you can put a great kit in an awful room and it's going to sound awful so i think addressing the room if you're in a position where you've got several rooms to choose from is like finding the best room or thinking about just the acoustic within the room the room you're choosing how you can treat that like we've already kind of touched on this it doesn't have to mean like loads of expensive treatment but once you've got the room right it then everything else kind of gets easier and if you put a, an average kit in a really good room it's probably going to sound awesome as long as you spend some time tuning it and you spend some time you know getting setting up the mics properly that kind of stuff it's probably going to sound amazing so for me the room is so vital and i think that's why so many people struggle when it comes to home recording because that's probably the biggest limitation as as a home recordist is your room yeah so in that case drums are extremely extremely difficult to get a good sound on so I think my advice there is if you, you need to think about the room, but if it gets to a point where you're not just you're just not getting the sound you want and you're not happy with it, samples sound incredible now. And there's so yeah. many ways you can work with samples and that can kind of help counteract that that problem of having a bad room. Whether that just means replacing the kick and the snare, whether that just means using complete drum software like Easy Drummer, Superior Drum, something like that. You can kind of go to two extremes with that. But even just like subtle, subtly adding samples can can help bring back a bad room and kind of bring that drum recording forward to a more professional sound that you might be striving for. So for me personally, I, yeah, I think it's it's the room. And then once you fix that, everything else becomes easier. And that's not to say that the kit isn't important, the tuning isn't important, the mic choice and mic setup isn't important. But once you get the room right, everything else definitely gets easier easier so yeah that will make that will have a knock-on effect that's great and and i want to add to that too and suggest that once you get the drum shells right so the kick the snare and then after that mm. maybe the toms you know the kick and the snare are really to me the core elements of of getting your drums right and everything else has a little bit more room for flexibility i woke up this morning to my clock radio going off and I woke up to uh, "Staying Alive" from the Saturday Night Fever <laughs> soundtrack, which was actually recorded and mixed on my console when it was at Criteria oh, wow. Studio. Yeah, and um, and I had met uh, the drummer, uh, and I apologize because I, I don't have his name off the top of my head for the for that record. And he said he came into the studio and they had looped one of his drum parts and built "Staying Alive" off this loop, and. Hmm. You know, the, the kick and the snare, when you listen to the song, the kick and the snare are just like that. And I think the hi-hat thing that goes at the end of the loop or something like that, that that's mm -hmm. the drum loop that the entire song is built off of. And so you have this solid foundation of kick and snare, but everything else like fills and extra cymbals and things like that are a little bit slushier and looser, but they, it all feels yeah. great, you know? And so uh, exactly. I guess my takeaway there is just, you know, adding to that that, having those foundational elements of your kick and your snare sounding great, which you can get from samples if you can't, if you feel like you can't get them out of your actual microphones and in the pre-production stage, just making sure that you've, you've got the right kick happening in the right time, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, yeah, yeah. I think that's a great way of looking at it. Get the kick and snare right. And again, everything else will kind of trickle down and, and be easier. Yeah. 
And I, I'm just, I'm brainstorming as you're saying these ideas. So I apologize. I'm not trying to one up you on any of these things. I'm just oh, trying no, to add, no. add to it. So, <laughs> um, well, yeah, let's, great. okay, good. Thanks. Thanks for letting me jump in with all this <laughs> stuff too. So how about, no, um, it. vocals? Let's jump to vocals. Uh, how, you know, your demo reel, which I listened to on your site has got all these great pop vocals on it. How do we get great pop vocals in a record? Yeah. So pop vocals, I think it always comes back to, and I'm going to start to sound like a broken record here. If you've got a good vocalist, that sounds like a pop vocalist and they, they suit that genre, then that's going to absolutely have the biggest impact on the end result. And if you can find a vocalist that is good to work with and, and just sounds amazing, then that's really where it's made and you can't make a, an awful vocalist sound great and pop vocals are all about having that big upfront vocal you know really nice to listen to with rock music that kind of stuff you can get away with bad vocalists absolutely and even some pop music can get away with bad vocalists but i think once you have that down everything else then gets easier and then to move on from that recording for me with vocals is not really the most difficult thing as long as you don't mess it up it's relatively easy you're dealing with one sound source and one microphone in you know 99 percent of the cases so it's as long as you don't get that wrong i think then pop vocals are created in the mixing phase and it's when you start to think about okay how do i make these uber consistent how do i make sure every single syllable is audible and that's just the case of uh personally i sit down an hour at least of, of the mixing process working with pop will be spent just automating the vocal and that's out of you know you know, five or six hours it takes me to mix a track including like prep time so so i think that's a really vital part of that process is getting that crazy level of consistency with automation and then kind of improving on that with compression you know a couple of compressors on there just to again rein it in even more but then with pop vocals you need to start to think about how to make it interesting how you can use spaces and how you can use reverb and delay and effects throws and movement in the vocal to create that sense of interest that we need from pop music to keep the listener constantly engaged yeah. and that really comes from the mixing process the record that's not to understate the importance of the recording and you need to make sure it sounds great um, in the room you need to make sure you're using the mic properly a lot of people um i find now they they will get confused if we're talking more about kind of home studio owners here they they get more confused um about where to place the mic if it's um if it's a dynamic versus a condenser and they'll get really close to a condenser and if it's cardioid that's going to sound pretty awful and then with a dynamic they've read online that you should be 10 inches away so they're 10 inches away from an sm58 and it sounds awful so as long as you don't kind of get that as long as you don't get that bit wrong i think really then it comes down to working with that and sp focusing so much of your time and attention on the vocals during the mixing process yeah. to make them sound yeah. like pop vocals well i my takeaway from what you're saying is a reminder that as far as the recording goes you're going to get a lot more out of working with a great singer than you are trying to lean on your great editing and comping chops with a not great singer. Absolutely. And when you when you have that great singer, it's just so such a more enjoyable experience. And you don't, you know, this also, I suppose, if we're talking about singers here, we need to talk about comping and how important it is to make sure you've got enough enough takes there because that's another big part of pop is it doesn't need to be one take. It's very very rarely going to be one take if ever on pop that you hear on the radio now so another element of that is if you've got a really good vocalist you still want to make sure you've got lots of takes there and you want to comp it you want to make sure every word is is perfect and then even then if you're working with a slightly worse vocalist you just need to do more takes sometimes and it is going to be more work for you but try and fix any mistakes with comping versus pitch correction and, and that kind of stuff i think is also another important element here talking about kind of the various abilities and levels of vocalists that you're going to be working with. I think if you take that approach of the most important thing is the vocal performance, uh, then it's your duty again to make sure you've got lots of takes there, make sure you're working with the vocalists, making them confident to get the best performance out of them. And then everything else will be easier. Yeah, right. So if we're talking about getting right at the source, we're saying the singer is the source or the song is the source for the singer. And the key is also in the middle of that. And then the singer is the source for the comp and the comp is the source for the tuning and the tuning tuned vocal. If you're going there is the source ultimately for the mix. Yeah. 
yeah cool. again it's this like trickle down this this is just the whole way i visualized the production process and i think it's it's a useful way to think of it it's definitely thinking of it like a waterfall and the more you can address those higher points uh, the easier the rest gets so uh, yeah absolutely all right cool so i can feel the the pl- the mixing and the plugins coming just right around the corner <laughs> uh, one more question how important is a mix template you know you talked about prepping a mix five hours, six hours, whatever that window is to be working on something. How does a template help you mix better and how important is that? Yeah, I think it's it's really important. Just preparation in general, anything you can do to reduce your actual time mixing, absolutely do it. And if you're listening to this and you're relatively new to, to mixing and that kind of, and just this whole thing, then you might not realize that definitely in my case and other mixes might be different, but half the time I spend on a mix is prepping it. The actual mix itself will probably only take two hours, three hours. But then I'll spend another two hours, three hours before that actually just prepping for the mix. And templates are kind of play a big role in that because anything you can do also to just optimize that process and that workflow and reduce time there is going to help if you're working on you know in high volume as well, especially. So template is very important. I've actually had a, a shift can't remember when it happened it was probably based on when like newer door features came out but i've started relying less on really big templates and more on channel presets so using a template i think is is vital and it forces you to think about mixing in this this way where you're actually like preparing for the mix but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have like this huge template where you've got every potential effect you might want to use is on on a bus and you've got like 10 15 different group buses set up for every possible kind of instrument for me it's a case of having the bare essentials are in the template itself so you know like a, a sub mix set up um your reference track um all your kind of like go-to effects so like a, a stereo delay a mono delay a, a room reverb that kind of stuff having all that set up and all your routing set up to groups that kind of stuff but keeping it more focused on the essentials and then relying on channel presets when it comes to effects. So if you're in the heat of a mix and you think, and you get towards the end of the mix and you think, "Hmm, how can I make this more interesting? How can I shift the focus here uh, for this particular section? You think, oh, do you know what'd be really cool here is like a really crazy reverb throw where just like the last word of this chorus just has like this epic reverb on it. You then have a channel preset that you just load up and you load up your preset that's called like Epic Reverb, something like that. Um, And you automate it and having that channel preset there can speed up that process considerably. So I'm not, I can't, I really can't remember when I started doing this. It probably was based on um, when that was actually available as a feature, but check your door. And if you have that, uh, if you can do that kind of stuff, I think that's also something well worth focusing on because once you have everything set up um, and you've got your kind of go-to channel presets, that's going to help you to cut down on your actual mixing time in the heat of a mix, uh, which yeah. is in, in many ways even more important than having a good template that kind of is your starting point for the prep, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I think that's cool. And and um, I think that what's interesting to me about the concept of channel presets that I really appreciate is the idea of making big moves. So when you throw on a whole new preset for something, it's like making a a big change appear out of nowhere. And that's Mm -hmm. something that I'm always trying to remember in the studio. We We can get so easily lost in teeny tiny tweaks to things when in fact, what we really need to do is make a bold statement, um, in Mm -hmm. our music and, or in our mix or whatever. So that's really helpful. Well, so, um, We're about to jump into our topic of the podcast, uh, the only seven plugins you'll ever need. But before we do that, let's take a short break here from our sponsors and rock stars. I'll remind you that you can find everything that we're talking about today in the show notes at rsrockstars.com and then just search for Rob Mazes. And we'll see you in just a moment for the jam session. Roswell Pro Audio brings you microphone design that is out of this world. Endorsed by a growing list of artists and producers like Phil Collin of Def Leppard, Ross Hogarth, who's recorded Van Halen, Ziggy Marley, and the Doobie Brothers, and Super Dupes, working with Drake, Mary J. Blige, and Eminem. These are all rock stars that have discovered just how great Roswell microphones sound. Check out the Mini K47, which uses a capsule modeled on the one in the vintage U47 at a street price of only $299. 
or the beautiful Delphos condenser microphone with a capsule tuned like the vintage U67 with great clarity and far lower noise at a street price of only $899. In fact, you are hearing my voice right now on the beautiful Delphos microphone. These mics are carefully crafted by hand and immediately feel good even before you plug them in and hear how great they sound. These are well-built microphones that will last you and your studio a lifetime of great recording. Check out more audio examples of these awesome mics at roswellproaudio.com. Are you having trouble getting your mixes to sound professional? Are you mixing and mastering yourself? Did you know that the vast majority of the world's best mix engineers almost never master their own mixes? So if you're thinking about hiring a professional mastering engineer, check out Chris Graham Mastering. Chris is a billboard chart-breaking mastering engineer who has mastered thousands of songs for both professional and home studio clients just like you. Send one of your songs to Chris and he'll master a sample of your song for free. If you decide to hire him, you can also get a free video mix consultation before mastering to help you get the most out of your mix. To learn more, check out chrisgrammastering.com or just click the link in the show notes. Hey, rock stars, we're back. We're going to jump into our topic of the podcast, the only seven plugins you'll ever need. My guest today is Rob Mazes, and then we'll jump into the jam session as well. Rob, are you ready to jam with us? Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Awesome, dude. So you've presented a bunch of great insight into getting things right at the source, working our way through the recording process, leading right up to the mix stage. There's been a lot of decisions we've had to make already to get to this point. The last thing we want to do right now is be overwhelmed with a bazillion mm. choices. So tell us how we can avoid that and how we can minimize this decision-making process around mixing. Absolutely. I think that word overwhelm is just so crucial here. And it's becoming more and more of an issue. This is something that I definitely struggled with, but it's even more so now as people are learning um, in this kind of online world where it's not just overwhelm when it comes to the amount of plugins available and the amount of equipment available. It's also overwhelm with the amount of information out there. It's overwhelm with the amount of, uh, you know, options you have in terms of ways of approaching this and everyone's advocating a different technique and different trick and this kind of stuff people disagree and it just very quickly gets overwhelming and youtube the, <laughs> youtube <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is it and it's it's a double-edged sword isn't it because it's it is it is amazing you know having all that information there once you you know how to kind of navigate it but it's very easy to get lost in that sea of you know, focusing on stuff that you don't need, maybe picking up on some bad advice here and there, maybe spending loads of time in certain areas that aren't important. And yeah, it, it very quickly gets overwhelming. And and I think the, the easiest way to address this sense of overwhelm, the way that's in your most control really, is by starting with your own equipment. And in this modern age, that generally means plugins. So as soon as you start to think about plugins in a more essential way and think about focusing on mastering f first of all the essentials but then also focusing on you know practicing with the plugins you already have getting to really know them rather than constantly you know picking up the latest waves sale which you know they're getting crazy right now and it's so so tempting and this is the problem guilty but then i'm, I'm yeah, guilty as dude. charged <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So am I. I'm preaching this, but I still I still buy these plugins. I still struggle with this myself. I'm kind of trying to follow my own advice as well, because it is so, so tempting. And that's not to say, you know, you, you should never buy another new plugin. But I think it's just taking a step back and thinking, right, the way you're going to improve or the quickest way, at least that you're going to improve and get to that point where you're really proud of your mixes and you're producing high quality work is by working on your skills not by working on the amount of plugins you have or the, the quality of your equipment. And again, you need to have a base level there. So you need to make sure you're actually, you know, recording with the right equipment. But with a basic setup of, you know, uh, an audio interface and stock plugins, for example, kind of the bare minimum there, you can absolutely produce amazing tracks. And the temptation is so strong to as soon as you get to that point and you start out and you've got your interface you've got your stock plugins 
it's so cheap and there's so many options out there now that the temptation to to just go out and buy a ton of plugins and start experimenting with loads of different plugins and start reading forums um not going to name any names but start reading um you know forums that are potentially kind of poisonous to your learning i think in my opinion because it takes you down this rabbit hole and if you take a step back and focus on okay what are the core plugins how do i learn how to use them and then how do i try and avoid all of that distraction by sticking to to just one plugin of each type and that's kind of where this whole idea of the only seven plugins you'll ever need comes from because really once you have these seven plugins and pretty much all of these will come with your door you know, in most cases you've got everything you need you absolutely have everything you need until you get to a point where you think oh, well there's certain limitations or you're actually hearing the downsides of stock plugins and you know this probably isn't going to be for a couple of years this isn't going to be until the point where your mix is already sounding great despite using stock plugins and then it's like okay now i can start buying them until you get to that point you really do just want to focus on the essentials so that's what i wanted to do here was just talk about what those seven plugins are and talk a bit more that's about great. how we can focus on those let's do it love it so, cool yeah I'll, I'll keep going um so to give you an overview of what those seven plugins are and there's kind of a bit of deliberation here and i'm going to expand on that in a second but just to give you the overview now those seven plugins are eq compression reverb delay limiter gate and gain and listing them like that is sounds like a lot but really when you focus on those seven plugins first of all these are the only seven plugins that people had you know a few decades ago they didn't, didn't necessarily have you know multi-band compressors transient designers all these useful tools but also distractions and complex tools that you can waste a lot of time and money on and these seven plugins so eq compression reverb delay limiter gate gain are all you need to produce studio level professional mixes even if you're only using stock plugins. And yeah. what I just wanted to do now was just kind of elaborate on a couple of those because some of those will be obvious. Okay, obviously EQ is in there. Yeah. Obviously compression is, is important. Depending on the genre you're working with, it could be absolutely vital. If you're working with rock music, you're going to need lots of compression. If you're working with jazz, acoustic music, that tool is not really even essential, but across the, the wide spectrum, compression obviously is vital. Reverb, you need that to create space. Delay, also important for creating space and important for creating interest and character, especially in pop music. Limiter, now this this is where I'm kind of shifting these, these plugins more towards someone that's just kind of starting out. And a limiter in terms of mixing, has uses you can put a limiter on a vocal it's a it's a great technique you can put a limiter on drums it's a very useful uh device when it comes to mixing but the reason i've included limiter in this specific list is because if you're working on your own mixes and you're not at the point yet where you're sending them off to get mastered then you're just going to need a limiter on the output just to bring the volume up and bring it to a um a good yeah. enough level to compete with tracks on soundcloud so so limiter is in there not necessarily in the mixing sense but more in that kind of mastering finishing off sense because if you didn't have that tool then you're going to struggle to get up to those levels of volume that are needed to compete but, um, you and, know also sorry, no. before we had daws and before we had plugins you know when we were using mixing consoles and analog tape the analog tape was kind of like we had a built-in limiting as part of our recording tools yeah. you know because the tape naturally limits and saturates the sound a little bit and gives us that that you know familiar vintage record quality so, mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to point that out, but keep going, please. This is great. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, so really useful tool. And then moving on, um, gate. So this is probably, we're getting into the boring ones now, the last two, so gate and gain. And again, just to bring it back to, okay, so if there were only seven plugins that you needed, you didn't need anything else to produce studio level mixes for me you would need a gate because when you're mixing drums, and again, this is going to depend on genre. If you're working with um, more acoustic live music, you probably won't need to gate the drums. But for me, uh, and this might just be personal, I can't get a kick or a snare to sound the, the way I need it to snare, uh, to snare, to sound. To snare, without, yeah. <laughs> Don't be snared snare by snare. misuse of gates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i can't do that without a gate so that that absolutely needs to be in here and it's kind of boring it's not going to have a huge impact on your mixes but for me if we're only going to st strip this back to seven plugins that needs to be there and then finally gain and you could do this 
if we were being very particular, you could just do this with an EQ. You could lower or increase the gain with most of these tools will have an input um, gain parameter. But having a separate gain there, I think, is important just for managing your gain staging. Um, I've seen a couple of debates online. This seems to be a hot topic right now if you're a member in any kind of Facebook forums. Lots of people talking about gain staging and in the digital realm, does it really matter? Um, for anyone that's kind of new to this concept, gain staging is just the idea that you need to make sure you're not recording hot and you're not mixing hot because in the digital realm, you don't need to be anywhere near zero. This is kind of a, an old um, idea from the analog realm where you're, you're pushing zero, but it's a completely different way of measuring sound. And in the digital realm, we don't want to be anywhere near zero. Zero is clipping. So gain staging is important in that sense. You want to make sure you're not clipping your mixes anywhere. Uh, but also gain staging is, is important when you're recording. You want to make sure you've got good levels when you're recording and you're not recording hot because on a lot of interfaces now and, you, and preamps, you get to that upper range and they actually start to sound worse. So you don't need to be there. So gain, right. bit of a hot topic, depending on, on where you lie with this. <laughs> you can argue that gain staging doesn't matter in the digital realm as long as uh, you, you're not clipping on your master bus. And that's true in a sense, but that completely disregards the plugins out there that do take the gain into account when they're processing. Yeah. Um, and very, it's, that's kind of dangerous advice. So for me, gain also is absolutely crucial. Every time I prep a mix, I go through and I check that every level is kind of just peaking um, at least below minus five. You don't, you really don't need to be uh, too anal with this. You don't need to you know, make sure you're at minus 18 on every single channel averaging around minus 18, which is what some people start doing. But just at the beginning of a mix, before you even listen to it, just check in there's no channels that are near peaking checking your group buses checking your master bus and having an, a gain plugin to do that is just going to make it so much quicker and easier than trying to do that on on your other plugins so so that's the seven and then kind of a, a note here on an eighth plugin that um, is also very important but for me it doesn't cr quite cross that line into essential uh, is saturation and you've already yeah. touched on this, uh, Lidge, mentioning, you know, with you had that built in, limiting saturation was built in when you're working with tape, but now we don't have that in the digital realm. So saturation is a really important tool for taking your mixes uh, to, that to that next level. And once you've got a really good mix, you need saturation to make it um, sound more interesting. You can use it as an effect as well as just as a way to enrich and enhance uh, your mix and add harmonics and all the benefits that come from saturation. But you don't necessarily need it to produce a radio worthy high quality studio level mix you could do yeah. it without saturation so it's it's not an essential but i just wanted to note there that once you do start to get confidence with those seven basic tools those seven plugins that's kind of the, the logical next step is to then start playing with saturation and bringing that into your workflow so and and saturation is not necessarily a sound that you want either because you Absolutely. know I'd say in EDM I'd say in modern stuff you may actually want that that almost digital quality of tightness and you know clarity and punch to your instruments might be more appropriate whereas saturation almost like um throws back to a time of analog tape which might be that might actually be the appropriate sound so it's really it's an aesthetic choice too Exactly, exactly. It's completely dependent. So, um, just, yeah, it definitely it needs mention though, because I've, um, I've kind of been throwing this concept around there for a while now. And that's normally the first objection is, well, what about saturation? But yes. we're, here we're really <laughs> focusing on those essentials. And, and I don't want to really go into exact plugins here as well, because I don't think the exact plugins that you're using for each of these is the most important aspect here. I think it's how good you are at using each of these plugins, not right, what plugin right. you're using. So if anyone does want to know exactly what plugins I'm using, there is a PDF in the in the kind of additional resources that I, I put together for, for the listeners. And that's at musicianonamission.com forward slash lidge. So if you want to find out more about um, the exact plugins I'm using, you can go to that. But just disclaimer Great. here, you could be using anything. So it's more about focusing on the essentials, focusing on how you're using those plugins, focusing on learning them inside out. So it's not just the bigger picture of focusing on these seven plugins as you're learning, but it's also when you're even when you're amazing and you're producing really high quality stuff, it's having just kind of one plugin for each of these, I think is a slightly fresher approach. A lot of people now have fallen into this trap, especially with compression, where you have, you know, you have 
five different compressors all emulating different hardware and that's the way a lot of plug-in manufacturers build their stuff um you'll have like an 1176 emulation la2a you'll have a fairchild and you'll make sure you have each of these emulations but what that does is that's adding kind of in some sometimes you do you need those uh, sounds and it's going to add the right vibe to the track but what you're paying to have that is you're paying with lack of focus if you're halfway for a mix and you're like okay this needs some compression you've then got to take a second to decide well which plugin am i going to use yeah what, what am i going to use and then also it's the time spent learning each of those plugins learning the nuances of each of those plugins in my opinion you would get much further by picking one a versatile uh, compressor and just learning that inside out because then you're really going to understand the nuances of how it works and that's going to remove also that kind of deliberation uh, during a mix so yeah so if if people do want to learn more about that it's just musicianonmission.com forward slash lidge but uh, yeah that's it's great it's really not the vital factor here uh, i think that learning the you know the the stock compressor which uh, every DAW has sort of like a clean digital compressor that'll do a little bit of everything, you know, and and the DAWs are all a little different. Um, Logic actually comes with a whole series of compressor emulations built in, so that's pretty exciting. But you know, just learning how to adjust the parameters on the compressor to have the effect of doing different things that you're hearing, and I think the first thing is to decide well, what are you hearing. You know, what, what's wrong with the sound and why does it need a compressor to sound more appropriate? And there's, there's all sorts of aspects to that. There's times where I've said, oh, I set the vocal just right in the mix, but it just sticks out of too much here and there. So really, I just want to find a compression ratio and dial the threshold back so that when those moments happen, it doesn't stick out so much and everything's mm -hmm. great now. And then there are other times where it's like, you know, you, you learn about parallel compression and you're like, okay, I'm doing this pop thing and I need the vocal to have a constant in your face quality. And so I need something that's hyper compressed mm -hmm. that's always sitting right behind the, you know, the vocal and, and blend it in. But I think it's at the point at which you've really learned the tools using the digital compressor and you've say, okay, I'm, I'm up against the wall. Like I, I've tweaked it every which way and I'm still not getting that sound. That's a great time to go. All right, now I'm ready to explore a couple of other tones from other compressors and find yeah. out if they are doing the thing that I wish this would do. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is this is the advice I would give to someone that's starting out, but I'm exactly the same. I, I, out of habit, I would, I do have, you know, five or six different go-to compressors as I'm sure you probably do as well. So you do kind of naturally end there and that's where the, the path leads. But up until that point, and a lot of people say, you know, when do I know that I'm ready for premium plugins? When do I know that I'm ready to start diving into the world of, you know, hardware emulation and learning all these different types of compressor that kind of stuff and generally i think the the kind of defining factor here is if your mixes aren't sounding great and you're blaming that on your plugins then you're probably not ready to, to start buying premium plugins or hardware or anything like that because as soon as you get to a point where it's like okay my mixes sound awesome like i've learned how to use the gear I've got. My mixes sound amazing. How do I take this to the next level? How do I further my learning? How do I add even more interest, more depth, more character? Um, that's the point where you start. But if you're thinking, hmm, my mixes don't sound great. Maybe I just need to start buying plugins. That's kind of, that's a, a, flat, a red flag there. And if you, if you have that thought process in your head, try and <laughs> remember this and remember, well, actually, I'm not even at the point yet where I'm ready to start venturing into that world because until I'm happy with my mixes with stock plugins or even just, you know, a, a single digital compressor, doesn't necessarily have to be a stock compressor, then you're not really ready to, to take that next step. Yeah, I think I've made my worst mixes ever in environments that had the most plugins ever. <laughs> you know, in fact, we yeah. we discovered things like having a ton of plugins loaded into your DAW can slow it down, in fact. And so sometimes if you want to streamline and have a faster DAW system, then you might want to actually remove a bunch of plugins you're not using. And then also just visually, you know, just actually making that choice and pick going to find one, even if you know which one you're going to use, just simply finding it in a huge list yeah. can be a challenge in itself. So um, exactly. I want to make one more comment. So the, the mixing console that I have, this MCI, some of the stuff you talked about in the plugins are all in here. So like every channel, there's a gain that will adjust the input coming into that channel or the mic pre itself. 
There's mm-hmm. EQs on the channel, so you can equalize the sound and adjust the tone of it. There are, and they actually put gates on every single channel on this console. That was like a new yeah. idea. They didn't put compressors on them all. <laughs> they actually put gates on them all. So I think that they mm-hmm. even then said, well, you know, you might want a gate for a really quick gate to like tighten up a kick or a snare, or you might want to think about a gate like a general mute, you know, like when something's not mm-hmm. happening, it should be quiet. You don't need a bunch of noise. Or you don't want tape noise coming through. Um, and then, of yep. course, there's like a reverb send on each channel, and there's an echo send on each channel. And then there's another gain setting on the way out because you've got a, a fader for the mix and a fader for the two mix as well. Yeah. So you can think about it that way. You could do this with a channel strip <laughs> pre plugin right. as well. If you took that, took that approach and moved it into the digital realm, if you've got like a good channel strip plugin, then try just using that. And that might help you to focus a bit more on those essentials, even if it's just as like a practice exercise for one mix, you try and finish a mix with only using like Waves SSLE channel or something like that. And then that will help you to kind of get into this mindset. So yeah, that's that's definitely another interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, very cool. So Rockstars, once more a reminder that uh, we talked about a lot of things on the podcast but Rob has kindly put together a PDF for you that that dives deep into all these and will remind you all these different plugins and show you the ones that he's using at musicianonamission.com slash Lidge. So go there on that link. That link is also going to be in the show notes. Just go to the show notes on your iPhone, your Android, uh, wherever you're listening to this, and you should just see the big fat link right there. You can click right through and go, go collect that um, and start getting your mixes killer. So we've got... Our final outro questions here, the the jam session, and let's just jump right in and, and I'll hit you with a few of these and then we'll kind of uh, wrap up. Does that sound good? Cool. Sounds good. Yeah, perfect. Groovy. So Rob, when you started out in recording, what was holding you back? So I thought it was my gear, but looking back now, kind of in hindsight, uh, the thing that was holding me back was experience. And this is going to be the case for everyone. It's interesting. The fact that I thought was holding me back was my gear, because in many ways, that's what was holding me back that thought process that "Mm, i need better gear that's the only way i'm going to improve is in fact what was holding me back so sorry a bit of a convoluted answer there yeah (laughs) Yeah, too many plugins (laughs) yeah (laughs) all right so now how about some of the best advice you received gonna sound like a broken record here definitely focus on the essentials as soon as i started learning from people um who knew what they were doing and i started you know seeing how they were approaching mixes and started asking questions like well how about this and why aren't you doing this why aren't you doing that and realizing that in reality that's that's not how you really approach this it's more about thinking about the bigger picture thinking about um how you're approaching the record and then just focusing on the essentials that are going to get you there Yeah. So uh, before we did this podcast too, you and I were talking about another podcast that's in the business world called Entrepreneur on Fire. And it's hosted by a guy named John Lee Dumas. And um, Mm -hmm. he talks about an acronym that he uses for focus, which is follow one course until success. And I think that actually Mm -hmm. also applies to mixing. And it's a perfect acronym for, you know, what you described as, say, starting with a channel strip. It's like, you know, the follow one course there and the focusing is let's just pick this one plugin that actually has most of the things I'm going to need in it. And let me learn how to use this really well until I succeed with it. And then I can move on to all these other aspects. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. All right. So, so how about sharing with the rock stars, a recording tip hack or secret sauce, something they could use on their next session today? Yeah. So recording specifically, move your head. (laughs) So if you're, if you're in a room and you're trying to record something and you're thinking, okay, where's the best place to put a mic? You don't necessarily need to throw up the mic and start recording, like moving it around with your headphones on that kind of stuff. Just go up to it, point your ear towards the source as if it was a microphone, just move your head around. It might look a bit silly, but this is the best way to find kind of like a sweet spot considering the room, the position of the instrument or vocalist to then kind of give you a starting point to throw up a mic and maybe experiment a little more but just rather than throwing up a mic straight away straight away moving around in the room and thinking of your ear as a microphone to find the sweet spot yeah i think that's a great advice um and that's always been surprisingly effective to me when i 
do that, especially if I don't have an assistant around, which I'd say most of our listeners don't have an assistant around. They're recording by themselves. <laughs> but, you know, a reminder too, a microphone is one ear. It's not both of your ears and it's not hearing it in stereo. So mm-hmm. you might want to actually even experiment with like plugging one ear and turning one ear towards the sound and move around like that. Um mm-hmm. But I don't know if there is any exact science around that either. I think that you just <laughs> notice that things sound different in different places of the room. A great thing I've, I find that I pick up on as far as moving my head is if you're listening to a drum set and you hear somebody on the kick drum and you move around the room, you will really notice that there is some awesome low end in certain spots. And it, that could be a great place to put your microphone. Absolutely. Chuck a room mic up there and <laughs> you won't regret it later. Yeah, and acoustic guitar is another place where I find that too. Listen to somebody yep. strum and move your head around until you're like, oh, I really like the sound of the acoustic right here. Yeah, it's um, such a simple technique, but so effective. Yeah, that's great advice. All right, well, so um, how about a, uh, a hardware tool that is maybe a favorite or you're excited about? Something physical that when you have it on your sessions, it just seems to make your sessions better. Yeah, so I'm very much uh, in the box kind of person. So for me, hardware is mostly my monitors, um, headphones. But at the moment, a favorite, um, just something a bit different. I've got an old secondhand baritone, which is uh, an Oratone style speaker that Behringer made. And uh, just having a mono... A, just a crappy mono speaker and fo- that really focuses on the mid range. I think that's such an incredible tool to have and just flipping over to it. Sometimes I actually spend, you know, an hour of the overall mix, just mixing on that small speaker. Um, especially if you're working with pop music, that kind of stuff, any mainstream music that people are going to be listening to on iPhones, laptop speakers, um, Apple headphones, that kind of stuff. Great little uh, hardware tool to have. And it only cost me about 50 pounds, I think. So super cheap as well. Yeah, right. Because the Behringer ones were even less than, uh, I think I have an Avantone, but it's been so helpful to have a small speaker to assist in my mixing because I have a pair of Venice 10s, my sort of, those are my big ones with a subwoofer and they get loud and, you know, they're all Mm -hmm. exciting and, and they rock and they can make my hearing absolutely exhausted because I'm cranking it up way too much. But it was that point in my mixing path where I began to incorporate some sort of small speaker off to the side, turned down low, mm. that I really gained insight into what was going on in my mixes. So I think that's great advice. Yeah, and you can take this you, you can take this and apply it in other ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be like an Oratone style speaker. If you don't have just some kind of mid-range focused speaker in your monitoring setup, you can add something like that really easily, even if it's just a, a crappy iPod dock that you've got sat um, at home somewhere or, or something like that, that you can then just incorporate into your setup and at least use it uh, for checking your mixes before you bounce them down. I think just having that is is such an incredible tool. And I think, you know, a good takeaway from that, too, is don't be afraid, rock stars. There is no one right answer in air quotes about, you know, what your small speaker should be. I think that you can get your mix any which way to any which thing and just get used to it. But the the key is kind of that that thing you're listening to doesn't really have any bass or low end so that it's helping you understand the mids and Mm -hmm. it, it helps you gain insight into things like, whether your kick drum and your bass are really reading in the mix, even when you don't hear a lot of low end in in the speaker, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Love it. All right, cool. So um, how about a favorite software tool? Something that uh, you want to share with the rock stars? Favorite software tool? I love Slate VMR because this is it's basically a, a channel strip. You know, it's, it's got your EQ, it's got compression, um, it's got a couple of EQ and a couple of compressors. It sounds great and it's pretty much got everything you need there. I don't use it so much now, but when maybe like a couple of years ago, I, I used it so much. And I think the reason it's one of my favorite tools is because it is so versatile. And I would just kind of look at my mix and notice that, you know, 80% of my plugins were VMR. And hmm. you, I've never really had that with another plugin. Um, I've tried using other sh- channel strip presets and just never really got along with them. So so if I had to pick a single favorite software tool or plugin, it would be that. Just to kind of another quick mention here as well, started using some of the Sonoworks correction software, and that's been incredible. I was really hesitant to start using that kind of stuff. I was taking more kind of purist approach where I was like, oh, I don't want to start messing with EQs on my mix bus and that kind of stuff. But 
that has actually been incredible they do one that's like room correction one that's for headphones so more that's more on the software side than the plug-in side uh, something else that i think is, is worth a mention yeah, so Sonarworks makes a plug-in that you would put on your master bus, and if you're mixing in headphones, it will take the headphones and help flatten out your frequency response for you, right? So that it's a little bit more like a flat speaker emulation. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And it, it sounds incredible. It's it's if you've got a you know a pretty well known set of headphones, I'm using hd 600s then then yeah you just load up the preset and and it's there and just flicking that switch kind of bypassing it and bringing it back in it is it's a, it makes a huge difference i think it might be a bit more difficult if you've got maybe a bit of a more obscure brand or model of headphone i think they offer to like test it for you but if you've got one of those headphone sets that's included on their list the software is pretty inexpensive and it could potentially have quite a big impact um, i think so definitely worth checking out yeah, and then do they also have ones for speakers now? I believe they had something that would try and flatten out your actual studio monitors, right? Or am I yeah. am I wrong about that? No, absolutely. So similar um similar thought process just counteracting like the the frequency response of your room to make your your monitors more flat and measuring and and this time you need to actually measure it so you need a measurement microphone and you play some like test tones through your speakers and the software takes you through it and then it creates you like your own personalized frequency response and i think it sounds scary at first because i was thinking i don't know if that's the best thing to do it's basically just an eq but um but it has positively impacted my mixes i would say and made them more translatable so um really that's that's kind worth, of exciting so you're you're working with it somewhat regularly more so the headphone one if i'm doing if i'm swapping over to headphones to mix for a bit i will absolutely use the uh, the headphone one i haven't experimented as much with the the room correction software so if you're going to try one and if you mix on headphones for any kind of extensive period of time when you're mixing or even if you mix entirely on headphones then i think it could make a, a huge difference more so than waves and some other uh, manufacturers have kind of headphone software that helps you mix on headphones but it will be more about making it sound like you're in a room and adding like cross bleed between the mm -hmm. ears and stuff i don't mm, really buy yeah. that because if you're if you're used to listening to music on headphones and if you're using references and you're used to panning and that kind of stuff then i don't really see the need for having that kind of like fake cross bleed so those they they never really kind of sold me but this this idea of correcting the frequency response of your headphones can definitely have a, a much bigger impact on translatability which i find is a, a bigger issue when it comes to mixing on headphones so there's one other tool that's still maybe a little obscure that i've seen that's pretty interesting though it's a hardware tool it's called uh, it's a company called rev 33 and they make this little passive filter box that you plug your sound comes in and it goes through that box and then it goes out of the box and to your headphones and it does a pretty fascinating thing where it it kind of does a resonant trap for the impedance of the headphones and to just describe it really quickly if you plug your headphones into an output jack and turn the volume up you've got sound comes out hits your headphones make sound out of your headphones but some of it bounces back to the input jack again hits the input jack bounces back to your headphone again and is like doing that constantly and in a very subtly subtle way actually affects what you're hearing in the headphones. So this box uh, traps that in such a way and filters that out. So in the same way that when you set up your monitors in a control room and you really just want to hear the direct sound off from the speaker to your ear, not bouncing off the walls all around you, at least not much, you know, um, that mm -hmm. this does that with the headphones. And it does a remarkable thing. It really does something to clarify the top end and the bass. And I actually use that when I mix it at um, my Bonnaroo Hay Bale studio every year. So just throwing that as, yeah. as an aside, as long as we're talking about headphones, might be something to check out. That's, yeah, I'm definitely going to be checking that out. That sounds awesome. Yeah, I'll, I'll put a link to that in the show notes as, as well, too. So Rev33 is the name of that one. All right, so now let's keep jumping forward quickly. We'll, we'll wrap up. Resource for the business or an online resource for the business side of doing this. If somebody wants to do this for more than just a hobby, what advice do you have for them, Rob? So in that respect, I would say the most important thing you can do is make sure you've got a good website. And I think that's so important. Now, the, the website isn't necessarily the, <clears throat> the thing that's 
I'm going to sell you. It's more a, a showcase for your your portfolio. And as long and, as you've, and you've got, got a great one, your website looks really nice. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I think it's important. And you need to make sure that the portfolio is like really easy to get to because that's what's going to sell you. That's what um, is kind of like proof of your work. But having a good looking website alone is going to help you to just appear to be more professional, especially if you're just starting out. But more is kind of like a vehicle for your portfolio and a really easy way that people can find out a bit more about you. But more importantly, listen to your work. And to give a specific tool, I would say Squarespace is definitely the best thing to set that up on. Um, I use WordPress for everything, but um, it's it's a bit more complicated and you have to set a lot of it up yourself. So if you just want to get a website up then going so that you can show off your portfolio, then check out Squarespace and you can make really kind of nice, beautiful websites on that um, in yeah, a very quick period of time. I agree. I'd say the people that I've seen coming along with the new website that have used Squarespace, they always end up with one that looks really cool. And you're like, oh man, how'd you do that? That looks so <laughs> badass. So I completely exactly. agree. Um, and exactly. then you also did another smart thing, which is you needed a, a, a reel to show, or you needed to show the music you were doing. And rather than have like 10 tracks of 10 songs, you created one demo reel, right? Um, that mm -hmm. you host on SoundCloud or something like that. And it plays samples of different songs. I thought that was a smart way to do it. Yeah, because this, I don't know about you, but whenever I look at um, other people's websites and I want to listen to their work, generally it will be, uh, yeah, like 10 individual songs. And I just, I, I end up skipping through them anyway, um, or just yeah. listening to the introductions. And then you're probably listening to, the, uh, you could be listening to like the, the most boring bits of the song and it's not going to like really rope people in. Whereas if you have a one, two minute showreel that's just like really engaging, if you can make a video to go along with it as well. My friend Jason Moss does this really well. If you go to jasonmoss.com, um, I believe I'll double check that but he his portfolio has got a video that goes with it so anything you can do to make your portfolio more interesting more engaging make it really grab people catch their attention then keep them there they're going to actually hear your work um, whereas if you just kind of like chuck some tracks up the temptation is that people skip through it they don't really listen properly they're maybe not hearing the best bits whereas if you create a short intensive show where you can really show off your best bits and show off um, your best work which super I think smart could have a huge impact love that idea of making a video that accompanies it you know put all this exciting exploding fireworks on it or something like <laughs> exactly and if you if you're working with artists that are making music videos anyway for the tracks that you've worked on then it looks awesome because yeah. um, you just you just you know get their permission <laughs> you use the actual music video for the music and then it, it oh yeah really good cool. call yeah good idea all right so um next question organizational online resource how do you suggest that the rock stars keep their shit together <laughs> um yeah this is another good question i i live off trello so everything i do is in trello whether that's uh, my personal life whether that's business um keeping track of pretty much anything is in there and it's kind of if if you're not familiar with trello it's kind of like a if pinterest and evernote had a had a child and it's <laughs> like um <laughs> you pin notes and cards and then you can organize cards in different ways you can create like to-do lists you can have like kanban boards and all this kind of like crazy way of like organizing your workflow but also just for keeping notes um for keeping track of deadlines for clients keeping track of anything pretty much um you can do in their signature calendar that kind of stuff so yeah trello is is huge for me and i'd absolutely recommend it and it's completely free yeah well let's let's pick one real world example somebody's making a record it's got 10 songs on it you could create 10 cards one for each song and then you can move the cards over to different you know one is like drums tracking then the next thing is bass and you just keep as you finish overdubs on a record you just kind of move those cards over and keep track of where you're at and what you need mm -hmm. and you flip the card over and you can add more notes to it yeah absolutely and it is so like customizable as well and, and it's such a simple concept like these columns with cards on them but you can use that in so many different ways so yeah exactly great use case there oh yeah and the best part rockstars i don't know that you're gonna have to spend much money on it you can do pretty much most of what you need with the free version i think to start definitely i've the <laughs> it's kind of a shame the paid features are like really not that useful it's like stickers and stuff like that so i'm not <laughs> I'm not sure really how they function as, as a business because... Oh, come on, man. Yeah, Who doesn't like stickers? <laughs> they do look pretty cool. <laughs> um, all right, cool. So now how about uh, the, the last two questions here are both hypothetical. Um, imagine you were starting over or you're giving advice to our audience who are just starting out. Need a simple setup to record music with. Got to find people to record and make music with. 
and um, maybe somebody's got to make ends meet and survive during this process of building up their career. What, what advice would you have? So advice in terms of the actual setup or just advice for how to approach that and, and get started? Yeah, I think just general, um, you know, like what do people need to go invest $100,000 and build a studio? Do they need to, uh, you know, do they need to go yeah. get a Fisher Price cassette recorder <laughs> from, from a vintage yeah. thrift shop? What do, what do they need to do to start out here? Yeah, so this is this is the incredible um, time that we live in. It's so easy to get started with this. Um, so all you need is grab an audio interface, USB audio interface. Start off with make make sure it's got two inputs and phantom power. Otherwise, you're potentially putting yourself in a difficult situation. Focus right, just to name two i two. That's that's a great one. Presonus make one. Um, yeah, it doesn't really matter. It's just any kind of U USB audio interface with two XLR inputs, and then I'd recommend grabbing to start off with a condenser mic and a dynamic mic and pretty much with that setup you can do a lot of cool stuff if you're working on your own music or if you want to start working with other artists in your local area as long as you can record vocals guitars and acoustic instruments you can then do everything else in the box if you wanted to so you could use drum programming software you can use guitar amp simulators you can do all that stuff so with pretty much just a condenser mic and a usb audio interface you can make records that could be played on the radio and be like smash hits Absolutely. yeah that's pretty so, that's great insight yeah so start with that and then you can kind of you can grow from there if you want to focus more on mixing then you might want to get a better interface or you could focus more on your plugin collection if you if you want to focus more on tracking then you're going to need a, a bigger interface with more inputs and more microphones but just make sure you first of all have maybe some some clear targets so you do kind of have um some kind of path that you're going down in terms of making sure you don't get going back to this idea of getting distracted by all the equipment and all the options out there try and focus more on the artist you're working with go out there meet people work with as many people as possible and then that will naturally create needs for new equipment and you'll you'll maybe you'll speak to a band they're like hey we want to do a, an ep with you but we want to record acoustic drums it's like sweet well i've got a job i'm just going to go out there and now buy like a 16 input xlr interface and as long as i think if the need comes first that's just generally a better way to go about it rather than going out there and thinking to make any money in this i need to have this crazy setup which absolutely is not the case you can get started with this whether it's mixing tracking producing him with a very minimal setup which is why it's such an incredible time to be living in yeah all right so now how about meeting people to record what what do you think are some maybe yeah. I, I don't know if you feel comfortable answering this but maybe you can give us a local version maybe you can give us an internet version if you feel like you have insights into both those yeah so i wouldn't necessarily recommend working for free unless you don't have a portfolio yet if you have because you, you can create a portfolio now by there's all kind of multi-tracks you can download online there's there's you know lots of people will offer that whether it's free or paid and you can get these like really well recorded multi-tracks and you can create a nice good sounding portfolio and to be honest i think that's the first step um once you've you you're confident with this stuff and you're you're confident you can make a good record and you create a good portfolio um it's then just the case of getting out there and meeting people and from this point onwards i wouldn't actually recommend working for free i know that's how a lot of people start out um you know they just go out there meet artists and say you know i'm just getting started out like i'll record you for free generally the reason you do that is to build your portfolio but now because you can get these amazing multi-tracks online if you just google it free multi-tracks you can create a portfolio from that and straight away start charging artists and the way you find them locally uh, if you want to work with local artists is just go to local events go to open mic notes get talking to people you can also one technique you could do is to actually reach out to people online but bands that are local so if you wanted to record them or you just wanted to work with local bands that you could actually meet in person uh, that doesn't mean you necessarily have to find them locally by going to local gigs you could still find them online find local bands and then just reach out to them and say hey like i love your music would absolutely like love to work with um you on something just you know should we go for a coffee or find give them some feedback on their music try and help them out in some way and then when they come around to making a record they'll think oh hey there's that that guy we spoke to we could see if he'd be up for it so you can kind of combine the online and local world and then if you just want to find work online without doing any <laughs> if you're just a bit of a recluse and you don't want to meet anyone in person you can you can do that too and then you could just offer mixing services online so same thing you could 
go about it in a variety of ways, reaching out to bands cold even, and just, again, introducing yourself or offering something of value, whether that's feedback, um, whether that's advice for their music, just kind of putting your name in there, um, not being too pushy about it. Or you could go down another route and join Sound Better, a great website now where you can go on there, you can create a profile and people can approach you for work once you start getting some reviews. Um, you could start a website, you could start giving advice in forums and Facebook groups, that kind of stuff. And then you'll become, you'll be seen as an expert in that group. And then if someone wants a track mix, they might think, oh, hey, there's that guy that gave me a couple of tips. Like, I wonder if he'd mix it for me. So you can kind of combine online and local, I think now, but generally it just comes back to this idea of like finding a way to deliver value and just get your name in there and make people aware that you exist and help them out in some way so that when it comes around to them thinking, right, we need to get this track mix or right, we want to record this track, you're the name that comes to mind. And then that's how you get started when you don't have kind of referrals from previous clients and that kind of stuff. I think that's great. And some takeaways from what you just shared with us, um, Rockstars, if you are trying to build something and you're feeling remote and you want to reach out and and build your client base through the internet, um, go to a place like Squarespace. You can build a great looking website very quickly and easily. I mean, quickly is always relative because when you do this stuff for the first time, it makes your head spin a little bit. But um, know that you can, you, you'll figure it out. You know, you'll understand it. Just give it a little bit of time to figure it out. As far as building your demo reel, you can, you know, go see robmazes.com. And Rob's got a great example of how to put your demo reel up there um, where you've got a whole, you know series of great examples in one thing. Take that next idea of building a YouTube video instead of just a, an audio player, if you want to have it be really compelling and fascinating to, to watch. You can get multi-tracks from all the multi-track sites. Rob, I'm sure that you probably have those at your site. Uh, Rockstars, I have free multi-tracks as well at mixmasterbundle.com. So you could go get in my instrumental track right there, build up a portfolio, assemble that yourself, and then just go out to these forums and places that already exist. But I warn you, don't go out and just post advertisements for your new site. Don't go out and, mm. and you know, Rob and I both build Facebook groups and we've, we've built communities online. And, and as a community builder, one of the things that can be very frustrating is when other people just come in and just sort of, you know, it's sort of like poaching. They just sort of post like, oh, come over, you know, to my website and and check out my studio or something. It's not quite the same as going into a community and looking for people who are having a discussion and joining the discussion, joining the dialogue and offering some really helpful advice, feedback when people have questions, be the one who comes in and and helps answer their questions. Or if somebody else does post their music, go listen to the music and say, and give them feedback. Let them know that you really thought it was great or, you know, you appreciated certain things about it. I think that's a great way to build relationships to the community. And that was a, that was a lungful there. Rob, take over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's that kind of value first, help other people first approach. If you're just focusing purely on yourself and like, okay, how can I find my first client and how can I start making money from this? And instead start thinking about, okay, how can I help people? How can I find artists that I can, you know, make make their kind of their mini dreams come true in terms of helping them realize and create a great record and if you can help people to do that whether that's just by giving them advice or whether that's by actually mixing stuff for them it's just that that kind of approach of helping other people first and then the rest will come in time yeah totally all right so now let's assume for a minute that you've got your site and you're able to accept incoming funds when somebody does want you to mix do you recommend that as the way to start making ends meet when you want to start out doing this as a business, or do you feel like uh, it's totally cool to go deliver pizzas while you're trying to make records at the same time? What's your take on all this? <laughs> I think it's it's always going to be a case of finding a way to support yourself as you grow, because there's there's also just so many options you could take here. We're, we're kind of talking about the kind of self-motivated uh, approach of creating your own business and finding clients. There, are, You can still, if you want to go a slightly different approach, you still can get studio internships and you still can work maybe in a a parallel kind of role like live sound that's what I did when I started out I used to do live sound for money and then I would do mixing and producing and that kind of stuff still for money but nowhere near enough to support myself so I think unless you're really good at this or you kind of get a a big kickstart and (laughs) 
please correct me if I'm wrong, maybe there are more people that are able to do that. But for me, it was like a huge struggle. It really was to to actually make ends meet. So I think you're always going to need like a, some kind of supplementary income while you're while you're growing. And then if that can be in a, a related industry like life sound which lends itself if you if you want to be an engineer then yeah. and then you can do that or if you're more a producer and more about the music then maybe that's like being in a covers band and like making money like playing at weddings and that kind of stuff then that's probably going to be better than delivering pizzas but yeah i think there's always going to be like that need for some kind of support to keep you keep you afloat as you build this more kind of freelance business that maybe focuses more on mixing or um or you want to build your own studio that kind of stuff yeah so rockstars my only encouragement to you is if you go to do live sound while you're building up your studio thing, please, 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 as quickly as you can, get very comfortable with wearing foam earplugs. It's the <laughs> absolute number one safest way to keep your hearing intact for many, many years is to just wear those earplugs whenever you're in a loud environment like that. Oh, dude, absolutely. And do you know what? One step further, you can get molded um, earplugs quite cheap now maybe like around a hundred dollars probably over there and that hundred dollars will probably be the best hundred dollars you ever spend compared to any piece of equipment if you can make that investment that could potentially keep you going for for years longer than than if you didn't have anything at all so yeah that's a very worthwhile investment yeah totally all right so here comes the last question rob this one is also hypothetical we're going to take the wayback studio machine you're going to go back and find young 13 year old rob who's uh, recording the first music for the first time with his band and um, give yourself one bit of advice. If you could tell yourself the single most important thing to being a rock star of the studio back when you were 13 years old, what advice would you give yourself? <laughs> it's a hard question. I, I'd say maintaining passion for the music because as soon as you start focusing on the business side too much or as soon as you start focusing on like the, the kind of the daily minutiae and it starts to feel like a job that's when you start to kind of feel like maybe giving up or feel like you're not enjoying it as much as you should be whereas if you just maintain that passion for music and you just make sure try try your hardest to make it not become a job and like always listen to new music always kind of um every day i, I try and write down three things i'm grateful for and if you can make you make yourself feel grateful for music and what you're doing that's going to make you able to sustain yourself long enough to make it in this industry because if you don't have that passion and you can't maintain that passion for the music and remember that that's what it's all about is the music and having an impact on people's lives and reaching lots of people through music um, then you're going to quickly get bogged down in in the other stuff and either a feel like quitting which is you know a definition of failure or or b just never make it because you don't have the commitment there to kind of push through that initial barrier so i think for me it would just be if, if I went back, I'd just say, you know, focus on the music, focus on other people as well and, and how you can keep having a bigger impact because otherwise it does maybe start to feel like a job and it's easy to kind of lose that initial passion that you have. And if that does happen, it's going to be so much harder to make it. So it's, it is a hard question, but I think that's, that's absolutely vital. Yeah. Well, you just gave me a great idea. So um, here's my idea, rock stars, three things you're grateful for. I'm going to put a sticky pad, like a post-it notes by the front door of the studio and try and get in the habit when I walk into the studio to start a session each day to write down three things I'm grateful for about music and recording on a sticky note and then just stick it up on the wall. So check back with me and see if I've yeah. got a wall full of sticky notes a year from now. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good idea. If yeah, that will have a huge impact. <laughs> Just Definitely. walk into the studio and be grateful right off the bat because um, mostly I am, but sometimes, you know, you walk in and you're like dreading something that you've, you know, blown up as too big of a, you know, too much pressure in your head or something, whether it's finishing your record or yep. your mix or dealing with a client, you, you know, that's challenging or you're just tired. So focus on what you're grateful for. Stay 13 forever. <laughs> well, maybe it. not. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Rob, thanks so much for joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars, dude. This was fantastic. And um, boy, we got you to share everything. <laughs> we got you to give away the whole farm on, on Recording Studio <laughs> Rockstars. So we really appreciate that. Rockstars, I want to remind you that 
Uh, go to musicianonamission.com slash Lidge and go grab the extra resource and PDF and all the details about the seven plugins that Rob has put together. Is that, uh, what, what, is, what should people expect at that link? Is it an ebook or is it a PDF? What, what have you got there, Rob? Uh, so there's there's a few things in there. I've got um, yeah a PDF outlining more of those seven plugins and specifically what plugins I'm using. I'll also include a video in there that goes into a bit more depth uh, into those those seven plugins and that whole concept for anyone that does feel, feels that that really resonates with them and wants to go a bit deeper with that. Um, and then also I'll, I'll include a few other goodies in there. I've got some cheat sheets that have been really popular with um, a lot of my students are so like a compression cheat sheet, um, an EQ cheat sheet, that kind of stuff. So uh, a bit of a, a selection just based on what we've talked about today, kind of additional resources that I think people would find really helpful. I just wanted to, to give them away. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for doing that. That's going to be great. And then Rockstars, of course, as always, we'll have that link uh, big and bold right in the show notes. So you can just go click on it right now. Go get your goodies. Um, Rob, let our <laughs> listeners know how else they might want to uh, reach out to you or follow you and, um, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So besides that, for sure, check out if you if you want to start putting together a website, that kind of stuff, then you can check out my my website, which is robmazes.com. But most of all, definitely musicianonamission.com. That's become my my my, like my Your mission now that's yeah my mission yeah i missed a trick there didn't i um <laughs> so you're, that's, you're, that's you're actually I, technically you're a musician on a mission on a mission that's what you are right yeah i'm still trying to figure out the, the ins and outs of that i'm a musician on a mission and everyone who joins is on some kind of mission there's there's right. there's probably a, you've you've got this all sorted with the rock star stuff i need to drill, drill into this and figure out how to make this a bit more cohesive but that's that's absolutely the main place musicianonmission.com and just want to say as well like thank you so much for having me here i think it's incredible what you're doing with this podcast like i was saying before there's there's nothing else really out there like this this valuable and this kind of extensive so um it's an absolute honor to be here and, and thanks for inviting me man it's been an absolute pleasure and before you go let us know where we've been talking to you from you are you are in a fairly exotic location right now yeah so i'm actually taking some time out at the minute in corsica which is an island off the coast of italy it's it was one of those where we were kind of like, where should we go? We Where should we go? We have no idea. And we just pulled out a map and thought, this island looks cool. No one else really knew about it before. And I'll give you one interesting, just very quick fact. Cause it's actually the murder capital of Western Europe. Because, Whoa. yeah, because the uh, the mafia in, not so much now, but a decade ago, the mafia here were huge. So <laughs> it's got the highest per capita murder rate of any European country because of the kind of like inter-family killings and that kind of stuff, which I find really oh interesting. Goodness. But well, um, well, but be safe. Yeah. Make it make it back <laughs> safely. And then um, I feel like there's a little bit of a life and studio takeaway there too, which is just like you know, think outside the box. Just pick a destination and a target with your music and what you want to do, and just go for it. Absolutely, go for it. That's that's the key. Make that first step is the is the most important thing. Awesome. Well, thanks, Rob. Look forward to meeting you in person. And thank you for joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars. Thanks a lot, man. It's my pleasure. All right. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw. And this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music